Today's video is made possible by our friends at EcoFlow. Welcome back friends to the shop. In today's video, we are going to be putting the 422 pound South German anvil on its pulpit. Let's take a look at our, at our raw material. We'll get the beeswax melting and you guys can help me pick the very best of the best that this tree has to offer. After the chainsaw milling, we ended up with a 20 by 24 timber here. Now what I was hoping was that we could find a section that would be big enough that, that was free of knots, meaning clear. These guys right here. And what I'm seeing, there's a nice piece right here, almost two feet that would be perfect. But before we cut this, we need to determine how high our anvil base needs to be. And we're gonna do that by grabbing our favorite hammer and measuring with the anvil on the ground. Traditionally, anvil height was determined by a man grabbing his main hammer, the hammer that you were going to forge with, holding it to your side with the anvil on the ground and in a relaxed position, measuring the difference between the hammer face and the face of the anvil itself. Now this is gonna vary depending upon how tall the man is and why this is so critical is a man could be, uh, back in the day, a man could be looking at 50 years standing in front of an anvil, anvil pounding on it and having it at the right height. So when you strike, your arm and hand is in the proper position is really, really important. And it's not the same for any two blacksmiths. I've built several anvil stands and in the past they were actually quite tall because my anvils were so small. This 422 pound monster is so big that our anvil base is actually gonna be relatively short. All right, so I've got my favorite hammer. We've got a Swedish pattern. This is what I'll be working with. And we'll hold it comfortably with our shoulders squared in a relaxed position. And we're gonna pinch that and mark that. And that determines that our anvil height is gonna be 17 inches. 17 inches is what we need. There's 16 right there. We've got, easily got it, 17 inches in between these knots. That's gonna give us a base for the anvil is going to be free of any knots and that's kind of what I was hoping for. Now I'm going to overcut this because I'm going to need some assistance, some help to get perfectly square cuts on this because I don't possess the skill to do it freehand. There's a handful of guys that might be able to do that. Buck and Billy Ray was here. I'll bet he could eyeball that and cut that straight perfectly. But his chainsaw skills, they precede that of the professional homeowner. And so we here, uh, we have to use a little, little bit of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of cheating to get that done. Uh, let's lay it out and cut out our first billet. I'm gonna overcut this about three and a half inches on each side. So that's gonna give us you know, roughly 24 inches. And that will, then we'll have plenty of room to, to square up our cuts. And if we do make a mistake, it gives us a little bit of forgiveness. Now I'm gonna try to follow this the best I can to make it straight. We will see. We'll use the floor jack to get the tension off. Now these blocks on the other side are gonna be used for other projects. So that's why I went to the trouble of doing this. We'll leave that under there so we can move this to its new home once it is free from the main timber. Before we make a cross cut, we wanna be sure and have an end grain sealant. My favorite thing to use is natural beeswax. Now, as we know, wood dries from the ends, not from the side. And left to its own devices, if I were to leave this log in this shop, it would take 10 years for it to fully cure down to seven, eight percent, an inch a year. That's a long time, that's time we don't have. So we can kind of cheat that a little bit by treating the ends and sealing that up immediately after we cut it. I, this log right here, when I made the initial cut, it started checking on the ends and the edges in the first 12 hours. This is a two prong digital moisture meter designed for wood. It's got these two prongs and you can see right here, you can check, check my moisture right there at 37%. So ideally we'd be at 8% or lower. And if we check this here at the edge, we can see we have 18% and at the center, 23. It's dried a little bit more on the outsides and the end grain right there at 19. So we're averaging right around 20% about what I thought. I keep my beeswax and granddad's old Xerox can 
Did you know that antifreeze used to come in one gallon metal cans? Isn't that weird? Normally I've had enough, I actually had enough from beeswax from the stuff that had been given to me from subscribers, but I've been running low, so I, I did go inside and steal one of Mrs. W's candles. <laughs> and this is a natural beeswax candle. Let's put this on the wood stove, get it melting so that we can slather that on in the moment we get it cut. Every professional steel saw I've had has been as reliable as Old Faithful. They start, the starting sequence is exactly the same every time. Three poles and then one. brothers that's the piece we've been looking for let's stand it up set the anvil on top of it and start making some decisions I'm going to seal this now, even though we're going to trim it, because I just, I want to stabilize it the best I can. Let's slow this down. So precious. That is nature's perfect seal, that natural beeswax. To the tree, it's like the balm of Gilead. That will control that, 
that drying process and this will have a long time to dry and it'll be a lot more stable. Our friends at EcoFlow produce some of the most innovative and powerful portable power stations on the market. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Delta Pro which produces a whopping 3,600 watt hours that can be expanded to over 10,000. The Delta Pro is just loaded with features. We've got four USBs and two USB-Cs that can fast charge 100 watts. We've got four 20 amp 120s and a 30 amp that can be used to power your RV or camper. The back of the Delta Pro hosts all of our charging options. Not only can we recharge with solar, 12 volt from our vehicles, but there's a fast AC charger that can draw 18 or pull 1800 watts that will charge this unit from dead to 80% in two hours. Here we have two plugs that will expand the unit to a whopping 10 over 10,000 watts with the extra battery options. The access panel to the right of the display gives us additional 12 volt power points including Anderson connectors. And if that wasn't enough, wait till you see this. Hiding behind this flap is what they call the infinity plug. With this accessory right here, we now have the ability with two units or a backup battery unit, we have the ability to produce 240 volts at 30 amps. Why is 250 volts important to you? You can run your well pump off of this. You can run a small welder off of this. You can run pretty much anything in your house or your shop with that 250 volt option. Having options is important to me. Having a system that is just stuck in the house that can't be used for anything other than that doesn't make sense when you can build something that's modular and you have options. You can get the battery backups for this. You could keep those in the house for emergencies when the grid goes down or power goes out. And you've got a portable unit that you can put in the car and you can use and take with you for outings, camping, hunting, anything you want where you need reliable portable power. EcoFlow's free app is clever. It connects to your devices and gives you lots of abilities to customize and to monitor everything going on. How much coming in, how much going out, so you can tailor your power needs. If you're interested in investing in your own EcoFlow portable power station, I invite you to click the link below. It's in the subject heading, and you can look across their many units. There's something there that will work for just about anyone. Thanks for watching, and back to the video. All right, brothers. This is getting good, huh? <laughs> I am pretty excited. Now, how we're overcut, we know that, right? So yeah, 24 inches right there. So we're, you know, we're seven, eight inches over what we need to be. But I just can't stand it. I want to sit it on here because we need to talk about what we're going to do for the shaping. Now, I had an idea that when I was going to build the pulpit, it was going to be uh, it was going to be angled like a two degree angle on both sides, the front and two sides and flat on the back. That way I could slide the anvil to me and my working side, I could get up close to it. But what a lot of you guys pointed out was, you know, you just don't know how big this thing is and how, where are you going to need to stand. So I think what we need to do is to flip this around. I'll go fire up the cat. We'll sit the, sit the old man on here. And then we'll, uh, we can think about this and look and see what we want to do and see how it feels together. And I can get some input from you guys. You know, we all remember Mr. Miyagi, right? Mr. Miyagi was a bonsai master. And he, uh, you know, the bonsai master will, will look at their, at their tree or their, their art uh, for an entire year, taking an entire year or more to decide uh, where to make one tiny little clip. So I think for something this important uh, that uh, it's not going to hurt us a bit if we set it up and kind of start getting a feel for it and figure out kind of together what's going to be the most appropriate base for the old man. Goodness. This is about 
where it'll, where it will sit a straight line from woodworking bench to anvil oh and check this out guys look what i found here i'm going to zoom you up i found some information in the original maker's mark now i'll include a picture here uh, you can pause it and read the story about the foundry or the forge but if you look right here compared to the picture right there you see the crown i hope you can see it there's a crown there the identical maker's mark uh, to the document that's pretty cool isn't it Mama. Ye old man doth rain upon his pulpit, would you not say? My goodness, that is an imposing thing. That is imposing. My heart is palpitating, actually palpitating with the fizz right now. I don't know that I've ex experienced it to this level. That's perfect. All right, so let's do a little rewind here and uh, we're gonna have to make some important decisions right here. As we know, this is sitting seven inches, seven and a half inches or so higher uh, than we need and we'll need that to, to true it we'll want to true it make sure it's flat one thing that i had heard and i don't know maybe you guys know more about this than i do someone said that they would set these anvils in hot glue is that true because i noticed when the old man was sitting on the flat concrete he had a little bit of a wobble to him and short of like 
mitering that or actually routering all that out, which I don't want to do. I don't like the look of that. Um, I don't know exactly how to stabilize that base. You can see right there, it's a pretty good wobble in it. So let me know what the best way to do to go it with that. Something that won't crack out. Uh, the other thing, the dimensions are nice. I, see, what I was thinking is let me grab you a little pattern. And this is the scale. This is where the ultimate, this is where the height will be. This is our 17 inches right there. So we, that's why I overcut a little bit. Not too much though. We do have just enough to work with. Right there. Now that is the shape, was the shape I was thinking of, right? So it's got just, um, I think it's an inch and a half or so, a taper in it right here. And I was going to taper, I was gonna taper uh, th this way towards the, the ceiling and both these tapered in, that inch and a half or so, whatever looked right. And so when you looked at it, it would have the look of, a, of almost of a monument. Now my, I thought about doing all four sides and my concern with that is there's nothing worse than walking up to with, uh, with your feet, uh, anything that's like a sharp incline like that, it's really bothersome. Your feet hit uh, and it's, it's, it's terrible. That's why your cabinets, <clears throat> have toe kicks. You'll see that there's a little recess in there for your feet to go in. That's important. And approaching and hitting that angle, that would have drove me nuts. So what I was thinking was that we would slide the old man to the back of his pulpit where there would be a flat cut or a straight cut as close as possible. That way I could get up on him when I want, if I want to work and do detail stuff and not have to feel like I'm reaching over the side. That's just my, kind of my musings, my thinking at the time. Or, you know, what do you guys think? We could do something like that, or we could leave it as it is and just hand finish everything, like right? hand plane it down so that it has a, a smooth finish on it. Do our boiled linseed oil. We've got you know, a little bit of checking right there showing through. We might want to put some banjos in there, you know, to tie that together with some hardwood, some hickory or something, or maybe some, some white oak. And if we did that, we could slide, we could slide him all the way to the back and I would have, that would be as, as good as things could get right there. And then we'd have a pretty good work area here. I mean, if we did that, just to picture it here for a minute, you know, I could bring him back to where he's flush. You know, right there. But I don't think that would be any good because my limited experience, sometimes I like to get to both sides, right? So that's kind of blowing that plan out of the water. And that may be an argument against having that taper, you know, that monument style is being able to approach from both sides. So if that's the case, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just trying to get too fancy here and and overthink it. I looked at the old pictures from the old days and those guys would take a log that really wasn't too much bigger. It's actually pretty small, about the same size as the, as the base there. And they would bear a long one, they would bury it deep in the ground. They wanted that mass. They wanted, you know, they didn't want it to give it all. And their bases were actually pretty small. So an argument might be made that we want to keep this pretty tight within the edges, you know, because that's 16 by 24 is the width of the anvil. So how far, how many inches can we go over before it starts getting uncomfortable? And how much time is the guy going to spend on the front versus the back is the question. Lots of questions. All right. Well, let me know in the comments. Um, vote in there what you think. Do you like that monument style? Do you have, am I missing something here? Uh, what would you like to see? And what, what's going to work best? Because this is just the billet. You know, this was not, I was not intending this to be the, the finished product. We just, this is what we had to work with. You know, now it's at a manageable size and we can actually manhandle it and get some tools on it. All right. Well, thanks for watching. I know some guys were frustrated that these videos are going too long, but uh, 
you just don't appreciate the grift, man. <laughs> it's a true master that can uh, make a whole video on one saw cut, right? <laughs> but that's not why I do it. I, I don't, I've got other responsibilities and other things I have to do, and I don't have all day to, you know, to do my, uh, to work on this stuff. So I, I work on it until I get bored or I have to move on to something else, and that, that's just what, I, what happens in a day. You get what you get, right? All right, well, thanks for watching. May God bless you and your families. Please keep us in your prayers, and we'll see you all on the next video.